welcome to another chapter of the Optica Industry Tutorials. It is 4 p.m. in Germany, 3 p.m. in United Kingdom. It is, what time is it now? It's 9 a.m. in Eastern Coast in Washington, D.C., in New York, and it is 6 a.m. in Silicon Valley. We are again in a global meeting to discuss something very important. In the next hour, we're going to have discussions about the use of adaptive optics in microscopes. The idea of this meeting is to understand a bit better how to improve image quality with the use of adaptive optics. And for that, we have two of our success cases in Optica, talking both from the University of Oxford as well as from Princeton University. Before that, let me remind you one thing. We are here building an industry together. My name is Jose Pozo, and I speak on behalf of 184 staff, 24,000 individual members, and almost 500 corporate members that are joining Optica to find ways to cooperate. Let me remind everyone that if you are here, you are here to contribute to an industry association. And also let me remind everyone, this is very important, all of you are going to be asking where are the slides after the meeting, where are the market reports after the meeting. Let me remind one thing to all of you. If you want to access all the Optica industry material, that means the market reports from Ondia, the short market reports from Joel, from Tematis, you want to access the presentations, the lot events, everything for industry is at optica.org slash market reports. As easy as that. All you have to do is optical.org slash market report, select what you want. For example, maybe you want the quantum computing report we just bought from, from there. Select everything you want. It's all for free for corporate members. You put your name, your surname, your email, and your company, and they come to your inbox. You don't need to remember any password. And with this, let me start. I am a huge fan of adaptive optics. We talk in the past of adaptive optics for satellite communication for FSO, but today we go from the satellites all the way to the microscopes, from the macro systems to the most, most micro imaging that we can imagine. And for that, I would like to introduce our speakers today. First, coming from Oxford University, we had the honor to talk to Professor Booth Martin. Martin, thank you very much for being with us. Please tell us who you are and what brings you to this meeting. Yes, thank you. So I'm a professor of engineering at Oxford University and <clears throat> I've been working for the last 20 plus years developing adaptive optics for microscopes. So I'm very pleased to be here telling people more about it and what, what the future holds for this topic. And we go from Oxford to Princeton and we have with us Professor Fu Ting Mian. Fu Ting Mian, thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us who you are, what you do and what brings you to a meeting on adaptive optics. Yeah, it's a great, great honor to be here. So my name is Timmy Fu. Uh, I just started as an assistant professor at Princeton University in the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering and Bioengineering. Uh, yeah, as a postdoc, I worked with Eric Bazic uh, on uh, adaptive optics. So today I'm mostly going to share the work I did with uh, Eric Bazic. Thank you very much, Timmy. And remember, all of you, the participants at this meeting, these people are here to teach us about the use of adaptive microscopes, but also they're here because they have also room for cooperation, for collaboration, and they want to know also what you do and find ways to cooperate. So for that, I would like to remind everyone during the meeting, if you have any question, use the Q&A button and post your question there. And also in the chat, also write your questions. But in the chat, I like when we have a little bit of an interaction. So you can already go to the chat, tell us who you are, where you come from and what brings you to this meeting. Let's get to know each other a little bit. And with this, let's start the tutorial. I, for me, it is really an honor to introduce the next speaker. We have uh, been working with the University of Oxford in many different projects from laser-based material processing, we have worked on biosensors, biomedical. Today, we have uh, a person who has held the Royal Academy of Engineering and EPSC Research Fellowships, and in 2016 received an advanced grant from the European Research Council. He was appointed Professor of Engineering Science in 2014, and in 2018, he was awarded the Young Researcher Award in Optical Technologies. He is an Optica fan. He is a person who has been received many awards, 170 publications, over 25 patents, and what we like the, more, the most in this group, he has co-founded two spin-off companies. Many of them, many of you know about them, Aurox 
and one that we love a lot in this community, Obsidia. Thank you very much, Martin, for being with us. It is an honor. The floor and the attention of the Optica community on Adaptive Optics goes to Oxford, goes to you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just check so you can see my screen? Crystal clear. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be speaking here. And of course, my talk is about uh, the work we're doing. We've been working in adaptive optics for a very long time, developing these for microscopes in many different ways. And I want to use this talk to give you uh, an overview of what we've been doing, uh, how far we've got, and give you a hint about what the future holds for this and the way we're building towards what we call a universal framework for adaptive optics in microscopy. And so the um, the give you some background of the research we do. Um, this slide tries to summarize what we cover in the group. We're a group of approximately 30 people working in Oxford with many collaborations across the university and across the world. And we're working in the development of adaptive optical technologies, uh, not only for microscopy, but also in areas such as uh, adaptive uh, laser based manufacturing uh, and medical applications and so on and so on. So in this particular talk, I'll be concentrating on a significant subset of this diagram, which is the development of adaptive optics for aberration correction in microscopy. And before I move on to that, I will, of course, just make sure I recognize all of the many wonderful people who are in uh, our group here in Oxford and all of the numerous collaborators we've worked with in order to do this. And I've most of them on this on this slide here, but uh, you know, really a lot of this work is joint. It's not just from us. And so I really do want to acknowledge all of the wonderful help we've had in doing this. So the issue we're talking about today is the problems caused by aberrations in microscopes. Now, in microscopes, although we might design these to have perfect optics, in reality, there are imperfections in there. Part of this may be because of the compromises we have to make in the design of the optical system, but often it's because of the actual specimen we're trying to look at and the optical properties of that specimen, because they're not uniform. They consist of regions of different refractive index, and when light propagates through those regions of diffractive index, the wavefronts of that light become distorted. And so even if we have a perfect system, the specimen will cause um, distortions of the wavefronts and hence distortions of the focal spot or the point spread function of our imaging system. So we have an enlarged focal spot or point spread function. This leads to loss of resolution and a decrease in image quality and contrast, as you can see very clearly in the examples I've provided on the right hand side of this screen. Now, the main reason behind this is because, as I said, we don't have, we our specimens have varied variations in refractive index. Now, I'll briefly show you in this slide what the effect of that is. So normally, if we think of light being focused by a lens, as you might see here in this case, then you will see, we can consider the rays passing through the lens and those rays will focus down to a point. Or if we do wave optics modeling, we'll see something like this shown on the right, on the left, where you'll see we have a focal spot, so the focus laser beam, which is confined in three dimensions. And it's important, these are three-dimensional microscopes, three-dimensional resolution, and they're confined in three dimensions. It's elongated along the optical axis, but that's just the nature of how focusing works. But this is diffraction limited. It's limited by the physics of light focusing. However, in practice, what we have is we often have to focus between through materials of different refractive index. So the rays of light will, will, will refract at the surface and they no longer meet up at the same point. The focal spot becomes distorted by these aberrations. And because it's distorted, we'll, we, we look at the intensity of it. We see it's reduced in intensity, but also it's particularly elongated along the optical axis because of these aberrations. And that is, of course, what leads to the loss of contrast and resolution in our microscope images. Now, a lot of these microscopes are applied to applications in biological or biomedical imaging. And there the problem is even more complicated than this, because not only do we have a mismatch in refractive index as shown here, we also have variations in refractive index within the specimen, which mean that this problem is even more complicated. The distortions are more complex and they vary as we move to different parts of the specimen. So in order to overcome this, what we need is a way of dynamically correcting for the aberrations introduced by the specimen. And to do that, we turn to adaptive optics. And what the key component of, 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 of adaptive optics is to have a dynamically reconfigurable optical element, which enables us to introduce an equal but opposite or a conjugate aberration to compensate for these specimen problems. So one of the most common ways of doing this would be to use a deformable mirror. Uh, which is have met various different um, 
different ways of implementing this, but they all consist of a reflective membrane whose shape we can change by the application of forces using an, an appropriate actuator structure. And the idea here is that uh, if you have an incoming, think of an incoming flat wavefront, when it reflects off the deformable mirror, different parts of the wavefront will travel different distances, and hence the wavefront will become distorted. In other words, we will introduce an aberration. But this also works in the reciprocal direction. If we had the wavefront coming the opposite direction, an aberrated wavefront could hit an appropriately shaped mirror, and we could remove those aberrations from the wavefront. So we can use the deformable mirror to correct aberrations. Alternatively, we use a liquid crystal device, a spatial light modulator. This works on a different principle, but has the similar effect. In this case, we change by applying voltages to pixels, we change the effective refractive index of the liquid crystal um, molecules behind them by, by rotating them in the electric field. The effect of that is similar, that we can impart or correct phase distortions in the optical wavefront. An alternative method is to use what's called a deformable phase plate. This is a transparent device, the light passes through it, but the, through application of voltages to appropriate electrode st actuator structures, you can deform the shape of this transparent membrane on either side of the, of the, uh, the liquid filled um, cell. And that allows you to uh, control the optical path length through the device and hence again, be able to introduce aberrations or in the reciprocal di direction, uh, remove aberrations. And all of these devices are in various forms commercially available. Um, including, for example, the sponsor of this particular talk, Alpo, there's one, one particular place where you can get deformable mirrors, although there are, of course, many other suppliers of these devices as well. So the key thing is that we take these devices and we place them into our microscope. So I've shown this in highly schematic form here, where we can think of a laser scanning microscope, where we take focus down to a laser spot and we will scan that laser spot around in order to create an image. But what we will do is we will place the adaptive element in this position here, where we will actually use it to pre-modulate a wavefront. Because what will happen is when that wavefront passes through the specimen, the specimen will, of course, be will, will of course introduce the equal but opposite aberration, which will then mean that we can get an aberration corrected focus if we've chosen the correct shape on the adaptive element. And we can use uh, any of these devices, of course, um, if we were using the deformable mirror or the spatial light modulator, they work in reflection mode format. So it's a little bit more complicated to implement than is shown in this diagram here. But in principle, they work in similar ways. Um, and the challenge really is not so much to, uh, to um, purchase these devices, nor is it to design the optics in order to actually build these into your system. The real challenge in these microscopes, in my opinion, is how you control these devices once they are in there. And that is where most of our work is in order to gone into, is how do we actually do this? Um, and we've actually applied this, we've done this across a wide range of microscopes over the years. Uh, you can see the results here stretch back over, over 20 years to the first demonstration where we did um, the demonstrations in laser scanning confocal fluorescence microscopy. We've gone through many different things. I've just got six examples shown on this slide here. The upper ones are what you might call conventional resolution, high resolution microscopes. The, the ones at the bottom are um, super resolution uh, microscopes, which use uh, combinations of photophysical and optical effects in order to get resolutions beyond the diffraction limit. But you can see in all of these cases, we've been able to develop and implement adaptive optics in ways which allow us to get better quality images after we've corrected for specimen induced aberrations. Now, in this talk, I don't have time to go through all of these different examples, but I will just take two of them from this slide to show you what we've been able to do as, as examples of both the, uh, the, uh, the, the optical designs and the, uh, the um, biological applications we've been able to get out of these. So the first one, I'll just take two photon laser scanning microscopy. So this is a method where we use um, ultra short pulsed femtosecond lasers to um, excite two photon fluorescence in a specimen. And in this particular system, we would place the adaptive element in the illumination path because the resolution of this microscope depends purely upon how well we can focus the light in the specimen here. And we then developed methods to allow us to determine what the aberration correction should be, correct that, and then get fluorescence-based images from deep inside specimens. And by deep here, we're talking tens or hundreds of micrometers into tissue specimens. And um, in this particular case, we, um, we only need to correct aberrations in the illumination path. And the way this works is that we actually used it to optimize the image brightness. And I'll come on later to how we actually do this and the methods behind that, but we were able to implement this 
in various ways. And here's an example where it was applied to um, embryology. So we were looking at fluorescently labeled mouse embryos. These are balls of cells at this stage where they're about 100 micrometers across. And we're focusing through to the bottom of these cells. And you can see from the video on the right that after aberration correction on the bottom, we get much clearer images with much more detail available in there. So we really see the benefit of being able to use adaptive optics to compensate for these, these uh, specimen-induced aberrations. Now, this was one of our earlier pieces of work, as you can see from the date on the, on the publication here. Um, but since then, we've developed these for many more microscopes. And the next example I would like to show you is one of our most compli complex um, adaptive optical microscopes to give you an idea of how far we've pushed this technology and the complexity of systems we can deal with now. Uh, so in this particular case, it's actually a super resolution microscope. It's a stimulated emission depletion microscope, which is a, a laser scanning microscope, which enables you to get sub diffraction limit resolution. And, and um, the, uh, I don't have time in the talk to go through the details of this, but I wanted to just show you the, the complexity of what we had to build here. This was done in collaboration with Jörg Beversdorf's group in Yale University, where, um, where this was actually implemented. And this, I'm just showing you the diagram of the microscope here to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. I'm clearly not going to go through all of the, uh, the, um, the basics of this, but just to point out that this is a microscope which involves two opposing objective lenses. So normally you have a single objective lens in a microscope. This has two and they're pointing in different directions and we're using them interferometrically in order to get uh, improved resolution out of this microscope. Now, because of the configuration of this, we also have two deformable mirrors in here. It's one per objective lens because each one of those objective lenses suffers its own aberrations from the specimen. And there's also a spatial light modulator, a liquid crystal spatial light modulator in here, which was used to shape the laser beams which were scanned around inside the specimen. So the you can imagine the levels of control we had to get to, calibration and control we had to get to in this particular system, but we were able to develop sophisticated methods for doing this in order to enable us to do um, super resolution imaging in this uh, inside uh, intact cells. So to give you an idea of what we can achieve with this, um, this particular image here shows the confocal microscope equivalence. This is the conventional resolution version of this microscope. And you can see some, you can clearly see some, um, some features here. These are uh, microtubules inside the cells. And just so you know, the color coding here represents depth into the screen. So it's a three dimensional image, but the depth is encoded in color. And in this case, it looks like everything's at a similar depth. But when you actually switch on the super resolution version of this with the aberration correction, then what you see here is that these are indeed separate microtubules. So you can see there's definitely two there. And not only that, you can also see that they change depth in, in Z, which is now being resolved by this microscope. Now, I don't show you a before and after image here, as in before aberration correction and after, because the before image just simply doesn't work. You see nothing you have views here. And so we only see the after image here. But this can be taken further. We can actually use this, change the aberration correction as we scan through different depths of the cell, and then actually come up with a video showing that throughout the depth of this cell, all of this microtubule network at super resolution, the resolution here is down to the level of about, about uh, 50 nanometers throughout the cell in three dimensions. So you can see this has been enabled. This, if you, Without adaptive optics, it's not possible to get the resolution throughout the whole of this. That's very limited range. And we've been able to change the aberration correction throughout in order to achieve this. Now, I've shown the results here, but I'd like to move on to how to show you, explain to you how we actually do this. Because we, in order to be able to correct the aberrations, we need to be able to measure them. And the traditional way of measuring um, aberrations in adaptive optics is the way in which it would be used in astronomical telescopes, where this, this uh, technology was originally developed for scientific purposes. And the idea there is that you would use a wavefront sensor to measure the distortions in, a, in, a, in the wavefronts coming from either a, the star you were observing or from a guide star, which we were using to implement this. And by measuring the distortions of the wavefronts, you can use that information to control the aberration correction element, the deformable mirror or the spatial light modulator and so on. And this is the way it would be done in a, in a telescope, an astronomical telescope, but it's not always been easy. There's only certain types of microscopes where it's actually practical to use a wavefront sensor. And so actually we've been developed, mostly developed other methods, image-based methods to infer uh, what the aberration correction should be from these microscopes. And that's summarized in this slide here. We're using our microscope where we've added in the adaptive element. We would actually take, we would follow this flow chart here where we would choose aberrations and intentionally add them with the adaptive element with the purpose of acquiring a sequence of images 
uh, from which we can estimate a quality metric. And this is something we know is related to the quality of microscopes. So in some microscopes, it's simply the image brightness. In others, it would be to do with the sharpness and so on. And we would, we've developed efficient models to allow us to go through this process to take as small a number of measurements as possible in order to allow us to estimate the correction phase and apply the correction. So we'd basically be optimizing known mathematical models of how the microscope is affected by aberrations. And that would typically allow us to take the order of, uh, say, n, where uh, n measurements of, of the microscope, where n is the number of aberration modes we want to measure. So this meant in practice, we could take quickly take a few images, 10 or 20 images, which would be limited only by the speed at which the microscope can take the images, and then be able to correct the aberrations and take aberration corrected images. And this is a method we've applied to all of those examples I showed you earlier. Um, but this, uh, we've had, what most of our recent work has been doing is looking at this particular approach and saying, how do we make this more effective? How do we increase the, uh, our efficiency? In other words, the speed or the, number, the, make the speed of the imaging or decrease the number of images required to make these estimations? How do we extend the range of this? How do we make it work in more challenging situations? And so we looked at this, uh, this whole concept of image-based or wavefront sensors of adaptive optics, and we analyzed how we were looking at this. What, how do we represent the aberrations we're correcting? How do we optimize this? Do we choose optimization metrics? How do we actually estimate the aberrations from the images we're taking? And this has led us most recently to turn to um, machine learning um, methods for this. But machine learning methods, which are very different to the ones which have been used elsewhere. We've actually looked at the, the physical problem behind this and then designed bespoke machine learning approaches, which are actually turned out to be far more efficient than any of the other approaches before, because we've thought of this as an optimization systems problem, not just simply an estimation uh, estimation from images. And so we've done this by the way in which we've implemented this, just in brief, is that we've implemented neural network based estimations, but incorporated image pre-processing steps in there, which allow us to significantly increase the efficiency and the translatability of these, uh, these neural network based estimations. So addressing some of the concerns which people would quite rightly have in the past about machine learning approaches to controlling these systems. And so what we do is some very simple image processing, or pairs of images where we've, I, I still had done the approach before, where we've applied aberrations, taken collective images, but we pre-process the data, pass it into a specially designed neural network, which allows us to, based upon physical principles, extract information from there, allows us to work out what the, uh, what the aberration modes would be, and then feed that back to correct in the system. So we're sort of embedding these uh, carefully designed neural network principles inside the control loop of these microscopes, which is a very novel approach to this, and one which we believe is much more translatable than previous approaches. So just to give you a couple of examples of what we've been able to achieve with this, this is a very challenging application here where we've used three photons, so nonlinear, three photon nonlinear fluorescence microscopes to do deep imaging inside living mouse brains, where we're looking at uh, fluorescence calcium indicators. So these are, these are dyes which will flash on and off to indicate neural activity. And we've been able to uh, get this particular machine learning enabled adaptive optics methods working in this very challenging, very uh, low signal level situation. And so just some end results here where we've been able to get videos of neural activity. You'll see in these videos, things flashing on and off. Those are the cells when they're firing. We see the neural signals coming out of them. And when we've done the aberration correction, which is on the right hand image, we get much clearer images and we can actually get time traces and so on as well. So this is proving very, um, effective at working in challenging situations. We've also applied this principle, this machine learning enabled uh, adaptive optics control to super resolution microscopes. In this case, the example I show you here is a structured illumination microscope where we, these, these use a sequence of structured images where you've structured the illumination pattern with, uh, with sinusoidal uh, variations across the image. And this takes a whole collection of images, uh, 15 in this case with different orientations, these patterns. And then you extract from that a super resolution image. From the collection of images. Now, what you see clearly here is the one on the left before we've done aberration correction has been very has suffered severely from the aberrations which are present. But when we've corrected them, all of the imaging artifacts disappear and we see much clearer images. So we've been able to apply this to a much more challenging uh, imaging application here as well. And just a further examples of this, this is now a dual color, color image of a uh, neuromuscular junction in a fruit fly embryo. And after aberration correction, if we zoom in on particular areas, you'll see the details have improved. And we can also see that the uh, axial, the Z resolution, so this is the, the third, in the third dimension here, the three-dimensional microscopy, we've been able to prove the uh, results of this as well. 
So uh, what we've got here is a whole range of applications where we've uh, got a new paradigm for implementing adaptive optics control, which can benefit any of these systems using any of the um, any of the correction devices we talked about before, and indeed in applications beyond microscopy. So not only in many types of microscopy, but also beyond. So just to uh, conclude here, we've seen that adaptive optics can improve microscope imaging through implementing aberration correction. Um, we can see that there are many different AO solutions which have been implemented across a wide range of microscopes. And this is important because these microscopes have many different optical configurations. Then there's not just one optical configuration of microscope. There are many, many different types. And therefore, we've needed different implementations of adaptive optics. Um, and so uh, there are various adaptive optics devices which can are readily available commercially. So you know, getting hold of these devices isn't a problem. The challenges really are adapting these things to their work in the different microscopes and getting specific implementations. And I think the main challenges really, therefore, in this area are in design, implementation and control of these systems, which is why we're working on new universal, what we call universal machine learning methods, which will improve AO control and will be translatable across different types of microscopes, because this will be the key to making these more accessible to broader applications, including commercial applications. And on that front, I'd just like to point out that, you know, we are in the position to support development of research and commercial adaptive optics systems where we're in the process of uh, be able to provide this on a commercial basis where, uh, for, for any system using any form of adaptive optical device. And so yeah, across many different applications, but particularly in microscopy. So if you're interested in that, then please do contact us for a device and or collaboration. And we'd be glad to talk to you in more detail about that. And just some links there, website links, uh, my email address, if you'd like to get hold of me. And if you are interested in learning more about the basics of adaptive optics microscopy and practical implementations, then please go to this website here, aomicroscopy.org. There are many tutorials and hints and tips on there, which I hope you will find useful. So thank you very much. And if the audience is ever in Oxford, I would recommend that you stop by the university and see the facilities out of this world. Martin, it was great. What a great presentation. Thank you very much. While you were talking, the chat was booming. We have people in the room who are either monitoring wounds, monitoring agriculture processes, monitoring 3D printing. Even we have people who are doing retina imaging. All of them came here to look for cooperation and challenges, and many of them are looking forward to hearing from you. But in addition, they have posted very interesting questions in the in the Q&A button. And still, if you have more questions, please write them there. Let's go to the first one. Nima Abasi, she's wondering, how do you deal with the aberrations on the return path of light to the detector? Shouldn't the beam splitter be put before the adaptive optical unit? Uh, that's a very good question. Indeed, it depends upon the type of microscope. And I think you're probably referring to the this particular slide here. Uh, in this particular type of microscope, the um, the detector, all it needs to do is collect all of the fluorescence coming back from the specimen. So in this particular case, you don't actually require aberration correction in the in the in the uh, return path. However, in many other microscopes, you do, and so in that case, we would we wouldn't place the adaptive element here purely in the illumination path. We would actually place it uh, here in the common path. So for example, a deformable mirror could correct uh, both the illumination light and the light coming back to the detector. So depending, this is one thing I was trying to mention briefly in the end of the slide is that for every one of these different types of microscopes, you would have to design it differently and place the adaptive element in a different place, possibly choose a different adaptive element because of the what you're actually uh, doing there. So quite right, there is a huge variety here. And that's why it's sometimes challenging to work out how to actually implement adaptive optics in there and why, of course, we'd be delighted to help people if they were looking into this. The next question comes from one of my favorite places in the world. We go to Gubahati. We go to the University, Indian Institute of Technology of Gubahati. I am reading the question from Anupan Bharadvaj. And he's wondering, we want to know how do you implement an adaptive optical system in STORM, a Stochastic Optical Resolution Reconstruction Microscopy. Uh, we want to know how do you implement this in STORM since STORM involves a co capturing thousands of image frames. However, the fluorescent dyes bleach quite fast. So how do you tackle this without the optics in storm? Um, it's um yeah we we have we have done that we've done it in uh, different configurations of the microscopes as well. The um, 
the usual way of implementing it would be to use a deformable mirror between the uh, microscope and the camera. In Storm, you, you don't need to worry about aberrations in the illumination path because you just flood illumination. Uh, yeah. You do need to worry about aberrations on the imaging path back to the camera. So you'd place a deformable mirror there. Um, in terms of um, things bleaching, um, well, in some ways, I'd say that that's that's a problem with the dyes. That's not a problem with the adaptive optics. Uh, but of course, adaptive optics does help because it increases the imaging efficiency, which in generally speaking, allows you to reduce the uh, illumination intensity in any of these microscopes. And if you can reduce the illumination intensity, you will, you will reduce the bleaching effects. So simply using adaptive optics to correct for these things should actually have a positive effect on bleaching because you can turn down your laser power or your illumination power. I had the feeling you're going to like the next question. It's coming from Stephen Ditzel. I think you know him. I know him. Uh, in particular, for multiphoton and super resolution microscopy, do you apply the same correction to the whole 3D image stack, or do you have one for every depth? Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, when you feel focused deeper into a specimen, the aberrations tend to get worse. And so at different depths, you would need to change the, the aberration correction. Now, in practice, what you can generally do is um, maybe not necessarily redo the measurement and correction at every depth because they tend to change slowly. So you might be able to, for example, measure this at a certain set of depths and then interpolate between them. And that works fairly well. So the simple answer is, yes, you must change across depth, but actually you don't necessarily need to run the whole uh, whole uh, measurement and correction system at every depth. As you all have noticed, this meeting is powered by a corporate member of Optica, is powered by, by Alpao. Alpao powers and drives the adaptive optics on the research presented today, both from Oxford and from, uh, from Princeton. And Marcel Koenig from Alpao, he, she would like to first thank you for the presentation and then ask you what it is, a quite difficult question. I, I understand that adaptive optics are useful for TPE. TPE and super resolution microscopy. How much of a difference does it offer for confocal microscopy with one photon excitation using high quality optics, including high numerical aperture objectives for FLIM, MCS, et cetera? Um, I would say- Let that me it, simplify the question. Yeah, what no, I, is I the, answer. yeah, okay, go ahead. I can, I can answer it. Um, the, I would say potentially it affects any microscope. Um, the, um, any of those microscopes you mentioned. And in fact, we've done demonstrations in all of those microscopes you, you've mentioned. Um, the, this, the, even if you're, for example, doing, uh, you mentioned FCS, I'll take that example. We've done, we've done super resolution based FCS imaging. I know other people have done FCS imaging, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Yeah. Um, even if you're focusing a few micrometers into a single cell, you can see effects because of aberrations there. And we've got demonstrations of that in our previous publications. And so I'd say it's possible even there you will see these effects. Now, it is true that if you can prepare your specimen to have exactly the right refractive index, so if it's in, in pure water or you've managed to get some uh, sort of lens with immersion medium, which actually matches perfectly, in theory, you should be able to avoid aberrations by using that configuration. But in practice, if you're going to be going deeper into specimens, particularly if you're trying to do any form of tissue imaging, you will start encountering problems with this. So uh, often it's very interesting. Often you get people saying, well, in our imaging, we don't encounter aberrations. But often the answer is, is because you've designed your experiments specifically to avoid them, which probably means you've actually compromised on something else. For example, being having to fix cells in a particular way in order to get the particular refractive index. So um, yes, there are applications out there which don't require adaptive optics. And if you've got one of those applications, I'd advise you to stay away from adaptive optics. You don't need to use it. But many, many others where you'd be able to do other experiments if you did actually implement adaptive optics. Martin, I'm getting lots of comments in the in the chat and in my phone telling me what a great presentation you gave. It was great to have you with us, but you know what the problem, Martin, is? That when you give a great presentation, we're going to keep calling you for more and more and more because soon we have an event focused very much on microscopy, and I think you're going to be a fantastic speaker. I will contact you online for that. Martin, you were fantastic. Join me to welcome the second speaker today. We go from Oxford to Princeton. We want to hear from one of the leading centers on adaptive optics use for microscopy, and we want to hear about a very important topic, dynamics in multicellular organisms. Thank you, Tian Ming. Thank you, Professor Fu, for being with us this beautiful afternoon in Europe and morning in the United States. The floor and the attention of the entire world goes to you. Okay. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And the uh, most challenging uh, things to do are uh, uh, 
research talk is that you give a talk right after the pioneer of the field and uh, who just gave an ex excellent uh, talk, but I'm going to try to do my best. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a new system uh, we developed uh, together with, uh, uh, oops, sorry. We, we, with Eric Bezik, uh, Dan Miyoki uh, from uh, HH Machinile and Wes Legant uh, from UNC and Goku uh, from uh, Berkeley. So we're trying to use adaptive optics applying to different image modalities, trying to observe multicellular dynamics inside uh, uh, in vivo. So just a little bit of background. Conventionally, when we think about uh, microscopy, we always think about uh, spatial resolution. We want to go to diffraction limit. We want to go to super resolution. We now even go to Enstrom resolution. But the challenge is that if you want to image not just the, the structure, but also the dynamics of the system, now you face the inevitable trade-offs between spatial temporal resolution, imaging depth, and the phototoxicity. Because the higher the spatial resolution you need, the more acquisition generally you will need to take, which slows down your temporal resolution, introduces um, more phototoxicity into your system, and generally, it is harder to go deep into the tissues, as Martin just uh, gave an excellent introduction about why that is the case. And generally speaking, uh, there are all different kinds of uh, microscopes in the world now, Each, like a uh, super resolution technology, like palms, uh, storm, seam, or, or, or like a stat, or like the light, light sheet, light field, they're very fast, or like uh, we, we use, we can use multi photons to go deep into the tissues. So each of these imaging modalities, they champion different corners of these trade-offs. But so far, there's no technologies that can optimize all of these trade-offs all at once. And as an engineer, when you face such a challenge, there, there are generally three approaches that you can take to overcome this challenge. One is that you improve upon existing technologies. And the second is that you invent new technologies if existing technologies cannot solve the problem. And the third, but often, often overlooked uh, method uh, is that you can also try to integrate different technologies into the same platform and use different technology to provide uh, complementary information trying to address the challenge. So for, now, uh, for, for this project, we are trying to have all these three mass uh, approaches going on at, in, into the same microscope. So in the end, we want to uh, achieve a one plus one larger than two effect. So an early attempt of this integration improvement and invention approach is taken by the basic lab is that they integrate a technology called the lattice light sheet uh, uh, microscope, which was invented by Eric Basic, which can give you exceptional spatial temporal resolution. Can, for example, here they're showing uh, immune cells trying to attack uh, 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 cancer cells. And then combined with adaptive optics, which allows you now to go deep into the tissues and now you can look at um, this fast uh, cell dynamics inside the living organisms. For example, here you can see uh, immune cells uh, working in a kind of uh, a zebra fish in the ear, trying to clean some of these uh, nanoparticles. Uh, so this gives a huge uh, uh, success, trying to enable us to now see cell biology at unprecedented resolution inside the living organisms. But the challenge is that this is what the original uh, lattice light sheet with adaptive optics microscope looks like. So it is uh, on a four feet by 10 feet object table. So it's a huge system. It has great performance, but the challenge is that first of all, it's not compact. And because it, it is not compact, so it's not very stable over long-term. And this is really acquired if you really want to make this technology accessible to a broad range of biologists. And it is not very easy to operate. So you need an optical specialist trying to, uh, to op operate these systems. And uh, most of the demonstration in the past was mostly on zebra fish, and it is not very adaptable to, di uh, to a diverse systems. So when, uh, uh, when we started this project, we definitely want to maintain the high performance of the uh, adaptive optics with lattice light sheet microscopes. And we want to overcome all the challenges faced by this microscope to make it more stable, more compact, easy to operate, and adaptable to diverse samples. And we also want to make sure that this technology is uh, accessible to a, a diverse biological labs. So we want to make it, uh, it easy to align. We want to exhaust it, document it that. And we also want to uh, uh, make it cost effective. And when we started to design this second generation of the adaptive optics with lattice light sheet microscope, 
what we find is that these are all the components we will need. So we use uh, when to use uh, uh, two photon lasers to do the guide star, which I will uh, briefly talk about later. We need different kind of uh, uh, lasers to do imaging. We need a special light modulator. We need the, the formal mirrors and the scanning goggles. And then once we realize, okay, if we have all these components, then we can kind of build any microscope that has been invented in, in a way. Then this give us an opportunity to integrate all different microscopes into the same platform, trying to solve the problems that we faced before. So this is the microscope we built. We call it a multimodal optical scope with adaptive, optics, uh, adaptive correction, or short for mosaic. So this is what the microscope looks like. So it is on a four feet by four feet optical tables. So it has two orthogonal objectives used for light sheet imaging. And then there is an inverted uh, uh, objective for uh, 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 confocal or super resolution imaging. There's upright for two photon imaging of mouse brains. We have two uh, cameras for multicolor imaging and then bunch of uh, beam shaping uh, uh, optics to implement the adaptive optics. And then we have seven visible lasers and one two photon lasers trying to cover the broad range of um, uh, uh, light spectrum to do different color imagings. So these microscopes uh, contains more than 10 different operational modes. And one important thing is that each of these modalities can be, in, uh, it, it, not, not can be, but it is integrated with adaptive optics. So allow us to maintain the resolution even deep inside tissues. And uh, we, we can just like uh, easily toggle between these uh, modes by just like a, a click of a button of a mouse. So you can think about this microscope is like a transformer. And by clicking, a, uh, by use the uh, inter, uh, GUI interface, you can just change the microscope from a confocal microscope to a light sheet microscope, or from a light sheet microscope to a face microscope. And uh, uh, we also ex uh, exhaustively, uh, exhaustively document this, uh, the building process of this microscope. And we videoed a tape to where I was building the first, uh, first kind of this microscope. And actually you can see how efficient I am when I was building microscopes. And uh, our uh, team at Berkeley also spent a lot of time trying to uh, solve the data problem because we're, we're generating tons of data. And now there are about uh, 37 uh, research, uh, research lab around the world trying to rebuild these microscopes. So due to the time limit of this, uh, this, this uh, presentation, I'm just giving, uh, mostly focusing on the lattice light sheet mode, but also I will talk about how the other modalities integrated with adaptive optics can improve imaging qualities. So this microscope uh, first uh, improved upon existing lattice light sheet microscope. So now we can image across millimeter by millimeter by tens of micron uh, volume. And in, for partial cells, uh, we can image over thousands of volumes without noticeable uh, photo bleaching. And so here you can see, we can uh, look at these two color image and then you can catch like one cell divided into three kind of like cells. So cap capture some of these abnormal events. So this, this is great. Okay, so now we can see um, biological dynamics in such a high spatial temporal resolution. And we see like if once you put cells together, they start to interact and then there are new biology comes out. Then the question is, why don't you just go to image multicellular organism to see whether cells really evolve? The challenge is that if we apply this lattice light sheet microscope into a multicellular organism, even as simple as a, a C. elegans, the kind of small transparent worm, we quickly lose its resolutions. So you, here you can still see the nucleus, the cell membranes, but you, you lose all this subcellular molecular resolution again uh, from the lattice light sheet microscope. And this is exactly the challenge uh, Martin just uh, mentioned before, is the um, refractive index ketogeneity within the biological systems that scramble your light and make, make your image looks like blurred. So in our case, we directly uh, kind of like steal from the astronomers using their uh, 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 adaptive optics technology. So in their case, they shoot a laser into the mesosphere to create a guide star, and they measure how the, the wavefront coming back is getting distorted. And then the crack for the wave, uh, the, the sense the wavefront, then they use a deformer mirror to quickly change the shape of the mirror to crack for uh, 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 aberrations. And in our case, of course, we don't have a mesosphere. So to create this guide star, we're using two photons. So this enables us to create a localized guide star and then we using exactly the same methods trying to crack for these uh, wavefront aberrations. So the ad ad advantage of this one is a little bit faster uh, uh, to measure the wavefront and then you can go across different volumes uh, to apply different wavefront uh, at different locations. So for lattice light sheet microscope, there are three things we have to correct. So we have to correct for the uh, uh, 
aberrations on the detection path, which we use a default mirror from RPO to do that. And so we also have the correct for the uh, uh, aberrations on the excitation path, which we use a spatial light modulators. And then we also have to make sure that the light sheet is always on focus of the uh, 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 detection of focal plane. So just give you a very quick example. So this is when we apply a lattice light sheet to a kind of a mouse brain slice about 50 micron deep. So this is a, without a depth optics. So you can still see the cell bodies. You can see the axons, but not a very sharp images. And this is what happens after you apply the adaptive optics. So you can see a much sharper features. And this is just trying to show you the resolution so we can see all these dendritic, uh, dendritic spines, which is important for neuron computations. And for this new mosaic microscope, we have uh, collaborating with a broad range of biologists trying to make sure that the microscope work across different uh, model organisms. And I'm going to show you two examples. And the first example is uh, something called a Drosophila brain development. And this is uh, uh, trying to address uh, one, one challenge is that people always say like uh, with adaptive optics, you can see much better um, features, but do you really discover new biology? So I'm trying to show one new biology here. So our collaborators at Stanford University, they are experts uh, in um, neuron development. And the one thing they want to understand is that how specific neurons know to make connections to another specific set of neurons. So which means that why neuron A will connect with neuron B, but not with neuron C in the brain. And they develop this olfactory uh, circuit system in Drosophila. So this system is amazing the way that when the olfactory box, or it's kind of like the other nose, different neuron types is mixed, mixed together. But once these neurons send, a, send their axons into the brain, specific cell type will only project to, to a given locations inside the brain. So once inside the brain, they're segregated. So this gives us a great system to understand how tar targeting specificity or mistargeting happens. And they want to image this um, uh, as a process. And they, previously, they used a two photon microscope to do the imaging. And they have some specific uh, genetic technologies so that they can label specific neurons. And this is what the two photon imaging looks like. So you can see the axon grow uh, as the brain start to develop. But one thing, uh, two of, uh, things I want you to pay attention to is, first of all, if you look at the timestamp, it is about every 20 minutes. So it's very slow because for two photons, you have to scan across the brain. The second thing is that you can see the axons, but it is the, the details at the terminal of the axons that matters to this um, uh, 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 projection process. And it's not very clear about these details. So what, what our uh, collaborators need is that they want a high th three-dimensional resolution image. They want imaging fast, and they also want to reduce the photo bleach and the phototoxicity because uh, it is developing brains. And they will also want to do multicolor imaging because not only they want to see the membranes, they also want to see all these the cytoskeletons. So this is, uh, again, so we used our lattice light sheet microscope to image this pr process, and it is blurred because of the optic aberrations. And with adaptive optics, you can get much better, uh, clearer uh, images of the, of, of the system. And this is what, uh, what, what we, we imaged. So if you look, look at closely, uh, uh, pay attention to the, the terminal of the axons. So you can just kind of uh, see these kind of very long kind of finger-like structures. So that they're exploring the brain, and they're kind of like uh, sending out and retracting. And when we send this uh, biological data to our collaborators, they said this is very different from the classical gross cone structure we learned from textbooks. And they said there's no way these long fingers are acting based, which is on the classical uh, gross cone structures. So we did a two color image. Now we're labeling different uh, cytoskeleton structures. And indeed, we find these very long fingers are microtubule based, not acting based. So we, this kind of give us a new kind of biological structure, which we call it, uh, we name it exploring branches inside of our bodies. And this kind of makes sense is because this gross cone structure is in a two dimensional cultural surface. So the neuron just need to, need, you know, need to make very simple decisions either to turn left or turn right. But instead the, the real brains, it is way more complicated. There are way more chemical cues and it's a three dimensional space. So it is way more effective for the uh, axons to send out their microtubules, uh, and then only the microtubules going to the right position will stabilize, and the other will retract. So this, I hope, I, I hope uh, this uh, kind of an example really showed you that it is important to use adaptive optics inside the multicellular organisms, and a lot of times you can develop uh, discovering new biologies. And the second example I want to uh, give you is that uh, we can image uh, it is on a zebra fish a tail fin regenerations. So zebra fish, unlike our humans, they can regenerate. 
So if I get my hand cut, my hand is just gone forever. But for zebra fish, if you cut the tail, the tail can grow back. But again, because of the optical heterogeneity or aberrations, previously people can only see uh, uh, the, the regeneration process at a single cell level. So now with adaptive optics, now we can see much better into, into the, the details. So here I'm showing you, uh, and we're doing different uh, corrections at different locations of the, the tail fin regeneration. So this is a, the, the, the tail of the zebra fish. We cut on the right side here. And after the cut, there's a lot of these kind of micro vesicles released that triggering the regeneration process. And this is a three-dimensional uh, data set. So we can not only look at the surface, we can also look deep. Now you can see a coordinated cell migration. This is the regeneration process. So because this part of the cell is already cut, so the cell from the distal side will have to move here to feel that the wound are cut. And but not all the cells are, are involved in, in this regeneration process. If you look at the skin of the cell, so it's super dynamic. It's just like sitting there, but the membrane is very, very dynamic. And we can do multicolor imaging in this case. And so the blue shows the nucleus. And one interesting thing uh, we, we observe is that now cell, not only cells can divide, during this regeneration process, cells can also merge together. So you can see both their membrane merged together and also their nucleus also merged together. And for this regeneration process, of course, there involves a, a blood vessel uh, regeneration. So you can see, uh, we can catch this fast moving blood cells, a uh, blood vessels uh, regeneration process. And the very last thing I want to show you is that you can see these very fast moving cells. So this, those are the immune cells uh, of our body that are trying to clear the debris of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the wound cut. So hopefully this uh, video show you how critical it is to use adaptive optics. And now you can see a very rich event of biology that cannot be observed before. Of course, uh, then the question is, is the lattice light sheet with adaptive optics the universal microscope? Actually, it is not. So one of our collaborators, uh, when they're trying to, uh, they're, they are curious about how the neurons inside the hindbrain of the zebra fish develop. But the challenge is that when we apply lattice light sheet, even with adaptive optics, we cannot get good corrections. So this is the best we can do. The reason is because of, is for, for any light sheet microscope, you kind of need to, uh, about like 180 degrees without a, a huge uh, scatterings or, or very big aberrations. Because adaptive optics can correct for aberrations, but not scatterings. And luckily, uh, we have um, uh, uh, another objectives uh, 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 beneath these uh, two uh, light sheet objectives. Now we can use a confocal, line scan confocal microscopes <laughs> trying to image this region because now you, you, you can kind of like um, avoid these uh, eyes and the ears region of the zebra fish. And again, adaptive optics can help you <laughs> get much better resolutions. And now <clears throat> with this uh, adaptive optics integrated uh, confocal microscope, we can image deep into the time brains and we can monitor its dynamics. But again, this is not, does not mean this confocal microscope is better than lattice light sheet because it's about two, 20 times slower than lattice light sheet. The actual resolution is about two to three times per poor, and it introduces way much uh, more uh, photo bleaching and the photo damage effect. And then a lot of people also interested in how, what about can we image the mouse brains? Yes, we can image the mouse brains, but if you even if you use a confocal microscope, a light scan confocal with adaptive optics, you can resolve all these fine structures, but you also see a little bit blurring, kind of like halo-like structures near the axons, and this is because of optical scatterings. And uh, again, adaptive optics can solve uh, aberrations, but not scatterings. And the most effective way to solve uh, the scatterings is through multi-photon microscope. And, and uh, as Martin just uh, introduced, so adaptive optics can also help with um, multi-photon microscope. So in this case, we combine multi-photon with uh, adaptive optics. So you can see as we gradually go inside a, a mouse brain, so adaptive optics significantly improve the imaging qualities. So you can identify all these uh, small dendritic spines uh, inside the mouse brains. So we're going all the way from the surface to about uh, 400, 500 micron deep into the brain. And not only it can help with structure imaging, it can also help with this, uh, the functional imaging. Now you can look at the calcium dynamics and with much better signal to noise ratio and also with much better resolutions. So here I'm just showing the comparison with or without adaptive optics uh, use, uh, applied to a multi-photon image. And of course, there's, uh, uh, but the challenge of a two photon imaging again is that it is way slower than lattice light sheet microscope because it's a point scanning technologies. 
And the actual resolution is even worse than confocal microscope. It's about two to th uh, three to four times worse. And because it's a nonlinear effect, so you will increase heatings and how to, it is hard to uh, do multicolors. So hopefully I, I, for the three examples I showed you is that no method that champion all of them, you really need to integrate different uh, methods into the same platform and use the best platform to, uh, image, uh, to image the correct biological uh, dynamics. And of, uh, due to the time limit, we will have all these other uh, 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 modalities I don't have time to show. You can combine it with uh, expansion microscopy. You can do a uh, three-dimensional structural illumination. And also you, we can combine uh, do uh, photo simulation for the microscope. And so with that, I would like to thank, so this, uh, again, this uh, 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 project is mostly uh, collaborating with uh, Eric Bazic, Dan Miyoki, Wes Lagant, and uh, Goku. And uh, we have uh, uh, worked with a, a, a great uh, cohort with biologists trying to help with their systems. Okay, so thank you. And uh, last thing, uh, my group is recruiting, we just start. So if you know someone who's interested in microscope development, just let me know, thank you. Well, I am very interested. So I can send you my CV because I found it very exciting. I, or I cannot even believe the kind of example that you have given us from the from the brain of the mouse all the way to the severe freeze regeneration. Thank you for the imagery. Thank you for all the information. Thank you for your room for cooperation. We have a few questions to address. The first question is coming from the Optica Corporate member Teledyne. Phil Allen, he wonders, how often do you have to adjust the aberration correction for samples like cells with rapid shape changes? That's a fantastic question. So, uh, the, uh, so, uh, the, so this depends on how fast your embryos develop develops over time. So not only we need to correct for um, the time change of, 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 of the uh, kind of wavelength correction. So we usually we correct for every like hour ish, but also we we need to apply different uh, wavelength correction to different parts of the embryos or, or, or the sam samples. So this is this is a great question. So you have to do this uh, uh, corrections. Um, not only in time and also in space. We saw in one of the slides two terabits uh, of data. And that resonated a lot with a few people in the chat. They wonder if, if data processing is the one of your biggest challenge and how do you are dealing with this now and how do you envision to deal with this in the future? Eh? This cloud processing something that you would like to address or quantum computing? What is what is the room for the future taking into account the amount of data that you're generating? Yeah, so the data actually uh, is a huge challenge. Uh, for example, for the uh, zebra fish tail regeneration that I showed you. So that data, uh, raw data alone is about 10 terabytes. And for now, we, yeah, we mostly just do, did the visualization of the data. We haven't extract a lot of uh, meaningful biology, biophysical parameters from the data. Yeah, so I think, so what will be the future for the data processing? I don't know, but what I know is, uh, know is that we definitely want to extract the biophysical parameters from the, this data and from this huge amount of data. And machine learning, of course, will be a great tool to do that. But um, I think it's, there's a huge room for improvement for data processing side. We have a few questions about your setup. You could print the setup again, the slide again with the setup. In the way, you, you had the wavefront sensor, then you had the adaptive optics, and then you have the camera. Uh, this It was one of your first slides. A couple of people are wondering about the specifications that you use for the... Yes. So you had the wavefront sensor, you had the adaptive mirror, and then you had the high resolution camera. Could you comment on the specifications for uh, either one of these three components? So, uh, so what we do is that we use we send a two photon uh, a, a laser into the system, and so this two photon laser is kind of like a guy star, and then we it comes back to a wavefront sensor. We use a Schwarzman sensors, so we mm -hmm. measure what the wavefront looks like, and then we apply the deform mirror. Uh, in our case, we're using RPO deform mirrors, so we we apply uh, then we, we we compute this uh, measured wavefront and then with the uh, RPO, uh, kind of like a default mirror trying to apply a counter pattern to that. Mm -hmm. So now I want you to dream away, to dream away. This is what you have today. Yeah. Uh, what would be your Santa Claus Christmas list for an adaptive optical element? I know what you have today, but what are your unmet needs in that respect? Oh, I, I so I, I honestly, that, that would be actually with a Santa Claus. So, so uh, I honestly think uh, the biggest challenge for adaptive optics now applied to microscope is the active wavefront element is a little bit too expensive. 
But I, I can understand the reason behind that because they want to do this really fast uh, time corrections for uh, telescopes. But, but the challenge for microscope is not we, sometimes we don't need this millisecond change of the mirror shapes. We just need, because we don't need such a fast. So if we can reduce the cost of the, the default mirrors, then I think I will, I'm pretty confident we will, we will see more broad uh, adapt, adaptions of uh, default mirrors. So we can slow down the temporal kind of like uh, uh, resolution of the default mirrors, but we just need to make sure we can do the wavefront correction. If you all look at the watch right now, it is 5 p.m. in the Netherlands. It is 11 a.m. in beautiful, beautiful Washington, D.C. with the headquarters of Optical Relay. And it is time to thank our speakers once again. In my opinion, this was one of our best tutorials. Thank you for not only the technology, but the way that you presented it and what examples you have shown. And also it was one of uh, the ones that we had more interaction in the chat with people telling us what they do and how they want to connect. Once again, thank you very much for making the Optica dream of building a global industry association a reality. Our next meeting will be in Denver, Colorado. And on Sunday, we all go to the Quantum 2.0 conference. I hope to see many of you there. And the ones that don't go to Denver, Colorado for Quantum 2.0, maybe some of you will be at Laser World of Photonics Munich. My entire team will be there and we organize our industry trainings and an amazing reception. Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Our booth is at the entrance. Come to our party. Until the next time, this was Jose Pozo on behalf of Optica staff and on behalf of Alpao. Thank you very much for being with us. See you soon. Bye-bye.